Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is James Idams, and I am the Academic Programs Officer at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, we are so grateful to all of you for coming out here tonight uh, to join us for this Great Ideas debate. Uh, I'd like to thank the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation for uh, helping us put this event on, as well as the Abigail Adams Institute. Uh, and I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Dan Danilo Petronovich, who will uh, introduce our speakers. Thanks so much for coming. Good afternoon. Thank you, James. And thank you all for joining us this evening. <clears throat> My name is Danilo Petronovich. I work at the Abigail Adams Institute here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The Institute is an independent scholarly enterprise interested in reviving liberal arts education within the Harvard intellectual community. We foster the spirit of intellectual adventure and seek to model integrative core learning, which we usually do by reading and discussing select important books. Check us out online at aicambridge.org, or better, visit us at our offices located on 14 Arrow Street next to St. Paul's. Today's special event, as James said, is made possible by our friends and partners, the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. Uh, We're very grateful for their co-sponsorship, and of course, to Diana Davis Spencer Foundation and their wonderful team. This is our third Great Ideas debate with these partners. And you can see the previous debates on our websites or on YouTube. The Great Ideas debate this evening is framed in the following terms. Resolved, return to the founders to save America. America is at a crossroads, and the way forward is unclear. Some ask whether our 235-year-old constitutional order is at death's doorstep. Many today hope so, many more think so, and yet there do remain articulate defenders of the American founding. All this raises the question, do the principles, institutions, and mores at the heart of the American founding and its relevance for the future of this country, and perhaps a direct question to the other speaker? The second speaker will then do the same, and then we go into the second stage of the debate where I will pose select audience questions to the debaters, the audience present here but not our online viewers, will have a chance to participate by asking questions. You should have um, these little cards um, um, that our team has distributed. So pre please write legibly and bigly and please be succinct. Um, I don't filter the questions or I try not to. Um, our student fellows, who you will see um, walking around, will begin looking for and collecting your question cards halfway through the debate. Mr. M Mr. Michael Anton will speak first in defense of the resolution. He is a lecturer in politics and a research fellow at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center in Washington, D.C. He previously served in national security positions for both Donald Trump and George W. Bush, as well as in the administration of California Governor Pete Wilson and New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani. He has extensive experience in the private sector and was educated at the Claremont Graduate University, St. John's College, and the University of California. He's per perhaps best known for his 2006 political essay, The Flight 93 Election, which was written under the pseudonym Publius Decius Moose. Mr. Patrick Deneen is the author of seven books, including Why Liberalism Failed, Conserving America, Thoughts and Present Discontents, and Democratic Faith. He holds a BA in English Literature and a PhD in Political Science from Rutgers University. From 95 to 97, he was speechwriter and special advisor to the Director of U.S. Information Agency, USIA. From 97 to 05, he was Assistant Professor of Government at Princeton. From 05 to 12, Associate Professor of Government at Georgetown University, before joining the faculty of Notre Dame in 2012. For Professor Deneen's most recent essays, I encourage you to read the popular Substack post-liberal order. Okay, Mr. Michael Anton will go first. 20 minutes. First of all, I want to apologize for looking like a slob, but I have a good excuse, at least a reasonable excuse, and, and it is... Uh, looks worse than it is, so don't have too much pity on me. If you're going to pity me for anything, pity me for the following. 
Um, I didn't know that Professor Dini had been a speechwriter. I was also a speechwriter for many years. And uh, to train myself in the subject once, I bought a book by Peggy Noonan, maybe America's most famous speechwriter, called Simply Speaking. And uh, it's just a short little book, explains how to do it. And an anecdote that I remember at the beginning, she says something like, uh, you know, when people are asked or surveyed on what their greatest fears are, I forgot what number one was, but it was something like being eaten by a shark or getting hit by lightning. And number two was public speaking. Um, I haven't had that fear in a while, but I have it now. <laughs> Which makes this a little bit dicey for me, but maybe more fun for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is, yeah, but uncharacteristically, not always, you know, sometimes I kind of like, oh, I'm busy, I know the topic, I can wing it. I didn't do that this time, and I'm really glad I didn't. Um, this is billed as a debate, okay, which means we're expected to disagree, and I like to say, my parents raised me right, which, which means I get invited somewhere, I try to be a good guest, play my assigned role. So I'm trying to try to do that today, but it becomes hard, because I read Why Liberalism Failed and many essays, and I, if I'm being completely honest, I didn't find a great deal to disagree with. Uh, and least of all in the diagnosis of 2022, however we want to define it, of the contemporary America, the contemporary West, whatever. Um, and nor did I even disagree much with Professor Deneen's account of how we got here to this point. Uh, speaking of which, this may rankle a bit, uh, I found something kind of familiar about his, that account. You might even say Straussian about it. Now, in the parlance of our times, I personally self-identify as a Straussian. Um, I gather that Professor Deneen does not, hence he may take this little comparison amiss, but he shouldn't, for when I say Straussian, I, of course, I mean it as praise. Um, now, none of these observations that will make yet make me a good guest. To the contrary, I'm still being a bad guest. I was invited with a certain expectation, and I haven't fulfilled it. So I'm going to try to do that, which means first I'm going to briefly sketch the role I believe I'm expected to play, then I'm going to state a contrary view, and then I'm going to split the difference, or try. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I self-identify as a Straussian, and you know I teach at Hillsdale College, and Hillsdale College is, is if it's known for many things, one of the things it's known for is being very uh, a strict and proud adherent of the principles of the American founding, um, it, uh, of the U.S. Constitution. It has a, re a core curriculum, a required course on the Constitution. It doesn't matter what your major is. Everybody's going to take that class, period, end of story. It has online courses on the Constitution for any adult who wants to sign up. By the way, they didn't pay me to say this, but you know, sign up. It's pretty good. Uh, it has something like five million views. So this is a college that's completely dedicated to the founding and the Constitution. Um, so what I think I'm expected to say or why I was asked to be here to represent the view that the founding represented a kind of political perfection or end state but in a non-historicist understanding of politics. That is to say, contra Hegel and his heirs, in this, in this understanding that I'm supposed to represent, history does not have a direction or a culmination. The same basic passions, or mixture of appetites, passions, and reason, operate within human beings in all times and places. The interplay of these factors, above all which are ascendant in given souls at a given time, that interplay explains both politics and history, but history understood as outcomes or as an account of what actually happened, not as an inexorable, pro inexorable process. Um, the perfection that this view claims the founders achieved was made possible by the discovery of a new science of politics. That's not a direct quote, but it's a fairly accurate paraphrase of Hamilton in Federalist 9. Right? We can solve problems that mankind has not solved before because of advances in the science of politics. Um, and this science in this account was like electricity before Franklin. Part of the nature of things and permanent but unknown and waiting to be discovered and harnessed. Now the obvious objection seemed, would seem to be that if this new science is as good as it purports to be, then it should first of all settle political co questions, at least the biggest ones for all time. Now that may sound kind of historicist, but again, in this understanding, there is no capital H history and thus no end state. There is only a rational state that was, in principle, knowable at any time, but in actuality discovered at a specific time. Uh, but once it has been discovered, the new science implemented, that should be it, right? Problem solved. So how did we end up where we are? Um, now, my, my school or my sect or my subsect answers that with a corruption narrative, right? Bad ideas corrupted it. In particular, Bad ideas imported from Germany corrupted it. Um, and this, uh, oh, I'll skip that. We gotta... Now, I don't think there's any question that that happened. Capital P progressivism, which many of my colleagues have been focusing on for 
decades, which is a German import, did change America. It changed our educational system, for instance. It, 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 there really wasn't much of a concept of the research university in America before the second half, really the third quarter of the 19th century. Um, it changed our government, ruled by experts, or in Woodrow Wilson, uh, one of the leading progressive scholars and politicians, called it the, the men of the schools. Uh, and it created a fourth branch, of, or it led to the creation of a fourth branch of government within the second, right? The so-called uh, administrative state, or in uh, a term much in use lately, the deep state. But those are two different things, although I'm not going to go into that now because it's kind of a side point. Um, and in a way, it changed our understanding of reality itself. I think prior to this understanding coming, you know, crossing the Atlantic and becoming first embedded among the intellectuals and then widely accepted, Americans were basically not historicist. But they have become so, or history has become a core part of American intellectual self-understanding. Um, for instance, the former president, Barack Obama, liked to say and said often, he would term something he didn't like as being on the wrong side of history, and things that he did like were on the right side of history. Um, uh, unlike the found, this is different from the founders' conception, the American founders, of a discovered political science that simply captures the essence of man and, pol and of politics. But, you know, like that old saw, I, I worked in the politics a couple times and I've read a lot of these memoirs and you know there's a famous one uh, or anecdote it's actually pops up here and there the one that I've heard the uh, the most and I think is true is that Jim Baker former Secretary of State and George H.W. Bush are arguing about some point in the Oval Office and I can't remember what it was and finally Bush gets uh, testy and decides to cut off the argument by saying if you're so smart why aren't you president uh, if the founding was so perfect if the founders knew science was correct, how did, how did this happen? How did we get here? How did a correct understanding of nature and a true account of politics, how could it be so badly and, and even easily corrupted? Okay, so this brings me to the contrary view that I mentioned earlier, which seems to be, if not exactly, Professor Deneen's argument, it, it, it's at least close or similar. Um, this view posits a fundamental change in thought, but places that change well before the 19th century. According to this account, the change goes back at least to the 16th century, to Machiavelli in some of the most famous tellings. Indeed, I note that um, Professor Deneen himself points to the Florentine as a prime mover in the story. Those of you who have the book, pages 24, 25, 100, and 167. Uh, the change was a, a reorientation of political thought away from looking up toward the virtue or completion or perfection of man's nature and downward toward the fulfillment of mankind's actual needs and wants in the here and now. The change in thought thus precedes and paves the way toward, and I think crucially is intended to pave the way toward, a change in political practice. So it's not a change in theory simply for theory's sake or for achieving a more correct understanding. It's trying to do something in the real, in the real world. In this understanding, these changes did not corrupt the United States and the founders' vision. Rather, not just the country's political principles, but the country itself are products of that change. Hence, despite America's immense and evident success in this understanding, it was doomed from the beginning, as are all liberal or modern societies. Liberal understood quite broadly in that sense. Um, so what we're seeing now is not simply the sad but inevitable or, or no, sorry, not no, are simply the sad and inevitable workings out of the core principles of a bad design. Now, Professor Deneen says at more than one point in his book, correctly in my view, that the classical and biblical traditions define liberty as self-rule of human appetites and passions, to forestall tyranny, and to allow and enable human flourishing at its peak. To reiterate, I think that's right. He contrasts that with a modern view of liberty in essence to do whatever we want, complete freedom, to fulfill whatever uh, high, high uh, ambition or base passion, and, and a kind of ultimately an inability even to tell the difference between the two or to sustain the notion that there is a difference. Okay? He, um, and he, does, he, he, that is Professor Deneed, can and does marshal much evidence in support of this view. But most of it, I think, is from philosophers and writers not, and less from the founders themselves who absolutely did believe in the classical biblical view. That is, the purpose of freedom is for uh, human, human flourishing and practice of the virtues. And it's not that difficult to prove that, I, I think, by quoting the founders themselves. You know, famously, uh, Washington from his first inaugural. I'll just give two examples. 
probably you've all heard them before, but you know, that there is an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. He says that no truth is more established in the economy of nature that there is an indissoluble union between virtue and happiness. And he goes on. Um, uh, or the famous quote, even more famous, quoted everywhere from Madison, that the Constitution is suited only to a moral and religious and people, and it, can't, it will not succeed in governing any other type. You, know, you, can, you can rack these quotes up. There's page after pages of them. Um, and you can even point to similar type quotes in the philosophic texts under consideration. For instance, L I mean, Locke um, actually says he has no problem uh, censoring atheists, or even really any view that he says is contra uh, contra contrary to public morals. Um, the great founder of modern economic liberalism, Adam Smith, has a whole second book, well, I guess there's more than one, but this is the other major one, called A Theory of Moral Sentiments, whose great theme is none of the stuff I describe in the free market will really work uh, or be sustainable without a moral foundation in human society, right? So it's not, it's not this kind of wide open liberalism. Um, I'm gonna skip that. Uh, even then we still face the, even, you know, then we still face the problem that even if there is a, some kind of intended secret radicalism to these thinkers, um, or if it's simply uh, a mistake on their part, they didn't realize the um, implications of the radicalism of their thought, we have to grasp the fact that it was these American founders actually acting in specific circumstance and not Locke or any other writer or philosopher who founded the country. And while they did so partly on Lockean grounds, they were founding a country, not writing a book. Um, and it's, it's, it's not very difficult, just as it isn't difficult, I think, to marshal quotes in support of an earlier understanding of virtue from these thinkers, uh, nor is it difficult to point to actual actions and laws that they passed that, that support this view. Think about I mean, another example, uh, the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 that governs uh, all the territory acquired in the Thirty Years' War, sorry, I have that on the brain from another seminar I did, the Seven Years' War, I like, that's a great trick question for students, by the way. You ask them, how long did the Thirty Years' War last? How long did the Seven Years' War? How long did the Hundred Years' War ask? You, you, you'd be surprised at what you get from them. Um, uh, all this territory that, had not been, that was not part of the original 13 and not yet organized into states. They write a law before the passage of the Constitution, and that law is really specific about the moral character necess necessary for free government and all these institutions that are going to need to sustain it. Okay. Um, and, it and, and, and of course, many quotes and actions that are not merely compatible with the founders believing that religion is an indispensable foundation for society, but you know, for instance, they had no problem with an established church at the state level and did not outlaw it. They outlawed it only at the federal level and tolerated and even encouraged all kinds of public support for religion throughout the states. Um, so what Professor Janine's book describes very accurately, again in my view, is modern or present day liberalism, which is to say liberalism perhaps since the late 19th century and especially since the 1960s. So the trends he describes, the reality he describes, is real, but it seems to me of more recent origin than he argues. However, even if what I say is true, that the founders got it right, but that their creation was corrupted later, that wouldn't necessarily absolve modernity or liberalism, uh, or even the founders, of responsibility for the present morass. The strongest point, I think, in Professor Janine's favor is simply, look outside, look what we've got now. Right? Anton may deny that this was inevitable, but the experiment has been run and we see the result. All he, meaning me, can offer is a counterfactual. Didn't have to turn out this way. To which Professor Dean can say, but it did. Right? I've got a real living example here. All you have is a maybe. I win. That's pretty strong, actually, I think. <laughs> um, now, I would be a really bad guest if I did not at least address the ostensible topic of this gathering, which is, is a return possible? I am tempted to quote Nietzsche, from Twilight of the Idols, whispered to the conservatives, man, unlike a crab, cannot crawl backward. Uh, but instead, I will say this. If we could go back, not to the founding per se, which we know had serious problems, compromises with slavery above all, but to the founding with all the later necessary corrections, wouldn't that be a lot better than what we have now? Right? Religion respected, morality rewarded, crime punished, decency encouraged, citizens treated equally, the laws enforced, the common good respected. Now, granted, that's not a popular view of what the founding was about today, especially not in academia, uh, when the founding is under assault from all sides, but I think he and I are probably not adherents of, of that view. We may, we may term the 1619 view. Um, I, I'm gonna, I'll take that one liberty and speak for you, but go ahead and correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> 
Be that in, as it may, the Straussian in me, of course, agrees that the establishment of modernity was a conscious act, a conscious break with the classical and biblical traditions. Um, but it is no less Straussian to observe that the founders of modernity and the founders of America thought they were acting out of necessity. That does not in and of itself make them right, of course, but before we can know that they were wrong, we have to understand their reasons. Several fundamental changes redefine the world from ancient times to, let's call it, pre-modernity, the late Middle Ages, the world just before the philosophic poli political revolution that Professor Janine and I, I think, both agree took place. I'm just gonna run through these very quickly. The, for the Roman conquest of the ancient world, the destruction of the polis, the eclipse and really almost demise of republicanism, the creation, uh, almost to coin a phrase, of the first universal and homogenous state, right? A one, almost a one world state. Uh, the rise of Christianity, the world's first universal religion. The attendant separation of civil and religious of law, a civil and religious law. Um, the division or at least confusion of, of, of man's loyalties. What's more important, this world or the next? Who do you listen to and obey, the prince or the pope? Uh, is it your city or, or God? Um, and then the fall of Rome, the reemergence of politics, but on an almost entirely monarchical basis, the de-evolution or descent of politics into dynastic wars, which is what basically every Shakespeare history play is about, just people fighting over who gets to be king. The fact that they're all brilliant <laughs> um, doesn't hide the fact that that's really the core issue that he's, he's showing politics. It's just people fighting over who gets to be king at the end of the day. Um, and the division of Christianity, the eventual division of Christianity into separate sects, which leads to religious wars. Now, whatever you think about modernity, it's an attempt to solve these, or at least address these problems. Now, this is, I'm not trying to be exhaustive with that comment because there's a lot else going on above all the rise of modern science and technology and how they enable political modernity. At any rate, it is one thing to criticize modernity. It may even be fair to say that a critic is not necessarily obligated to provide a solution. After all, if the thing is a problem, one should be allowed to say so, even if the solution seems elusive. Yet it's reasonable to ask, what else could, would, or should the founders have done? Or for that matter, the modern philosophers. Um, the old basis of political legitimacy had been destroyed. I am tempted to say, and, and had become impossible to restore, but that speculative, it may turn out to be untrue. However, I don't think it would be possible to restore absent a cataclysm of such proportions that few would wish for and uh, none would want to live through. The liberal solution at least did address certain non-trivial problems, the liberal or moderate solution. Politics eventually ceased being solely or largely a matter of dynastic wars. Religious wars, at least within Christianity, became all but extinct. Indeed, we may say today that religious wars are most common where liberalism, broadly understood, has the least purchase in the world. Terrible injustices of feudalism, slavery, and other forms of radical institutional inequality were greatly lessened, if not utterly extinguished. And this is before I even get to the main problem that modernity, I have that in quotes here, in case that matters to any of the listeners, the project of which liberalism is merely an outgrowth was meant to solve the main problem, which was the capture, imprisonment, and close supervision of philosophy or of human thought. Yeah. While I am just as opposed to present day liberalism as Professor Deneen, I find it harder to see an alternative to the original liberalism as he defines it absent the following. Absent the following. First would be the rebirth of something like the ancient polis, i.e. radically closed and distinct political communities, which are hard to imagine in an age of globalization even at the moment when, because of wars and trade issues and, other, and, and, and COVID travel restrictions and other things, globalization seems to be slowing down. Um, uh, but also hard to imagine because of the resistance that such radical separation would, I think, provoke in many people, in most people, in billions of people. Um, uh, they wouldn't like it, they wouldn't want it, and, and, would make, and it would be made more difficult by the, the simple fact of migration patterns over the last century or, or more, right? Uh, people live all over the world now. People from all over the world live all over the world, and how you're going to come up with this kind of radical separation, I don't, I don't know. The second, is these, again, I'm going through things that I think would, are necessary for a kind of restoration or, or, or going backward that I don't think are likely to happen. So the second would be a restoration of the connection between civil and religious law, i.e. either an erasure, 
of the distinction between church and state, or at the very least, a return to something like the medieval solution with all the problems that that entails, and which modernity at least partially solves. The third condition, I think, would be a radical retreat of science and technology, whether voluntarily renounced, which, means, which seems unlikely. I mean, we all hate our phones and complain about them, but I bet you all still have one. Um, I know I do. Uh, it either has to be renounced voluntarily or taken away against our wishes. But as long as technology, these kinds of sci science and technology are around, they would seem to make the first two conditions impossible. They demystify and disenchant the world. Hence, the, I think they help drive a decline in religious sentiment and genuine belief. And they make human beings um, kind of soft and comfortable, satisfied, but in a lowest common denominator sort of way. Uh, and thus unwilling even to contemplate the sort of sacrifices that living according to the old, older modes uh, would require. Uh, these are just the minimums, uh, as far as I can tell, the sine qua nons. And I hasten to add, um, one of the hallmarks of our time, a price of maintaining any position of respectability in this society, so I can say this because I long ago gave that up, uh, is uncritical worship of, quote, our democracy, unquote. Coming out against liberalism is actually kind of brave. <laughs> uh, one might as well say, I like Putin. <laughs> um, in fact, in a way, the two are interchangeable. Uh, to be insufficiently committed to democracy, as defined by our elites, is to be, is said, to be said to be in the tank for Putin. The same way that to be said to, to, to hate Putin insufficiently, for some of your critics, is to be understood as anti-democratic. Um, in any event, the un- or anti-liberal world would be anything but democratic, and we need to be clear in our own minds about that. Um, getting back to solutions, I mentioned Leo Strauss earlier, I am a Straussian. Strauss teaches a remark somewhere that the urgency, the urgent need for a solution to a problem does not guarantee the availability of a solution. There may be no easy or obvious way out of the present morass. There may even be no way out, absent some fundamental and perhaps unforeseeable change in our circumstance, a change perhaps beyond even mankind's ability to cause. So where does that leave us? Harvey Mansfield, who is here, is one of the reasons I'm scared, has been known to respond to the following question, What's the, who is the best philosopher, or alternatively, whose thought should we follow? And his answer, I have heard, I've never heard him say it, but many people have repeated this to me, so I believe it's true, is Locke in the short run, Aristotle in the long run. This wise answer gives not just Locke, but liberalism, and indeed modernity, its due while recognizing that still something is missing, something important was, if not lost, then at least obscured. Giving modernity its due doesn't mean complete submission to all its premises, but rather the recognition that it was attempting to solve real problems, that what it replaced was at least as problematic as modernity at its best, as to say as the American founder's modernity, and that there is no clear or easy way back to pre-modernity. That's before we even get to the question of how many people alive today actually want to go back. Now, uh, giving Aristotle or the classics generally their due means, first of all, to heed two of their most important lessons. The first is a warning against any attempt to rationalize politics. I think the classics would likely have taken a dim view of a so-called new science of politics. That is one that purports to say, we've discovered something that you didn't know about that solves all of the problems. Um, not necessarily because they would have thought all of its premises untrue, Oh, they would have had their doubts about some of them, but because they would have dismissed the entire project as impossible and undesirable, given the nature of man. There are certain things that just you can't fix, you can't solve, that are endemic to our situation. Um, everything, oh, the, the second is the notion, um, these are the two lessons, again, that we would need to heed from them, is the notion of the cycle of regime. Okay, I'm on the last page. I'm on the last page. The classics would doubtless scoff at any confident assertion that anything human could last forever, that any new science could overcome the built-in pitfalls of human nature. Everything human, including individual humans themselves, must be born, grow, mature, decay, and die. Uh, I mean, even the best regime in Plato's Republic, books eight and nine, are all about how it's gonna come apart, okay? Um, so, is then the misfortune or the things we see around us finally the result of liberalism or of human nature? and specifically of a misunderstanding of human nature. If Professor Deneen's thesis is correct that liberalism was not merely a mistake, but the mistake that brought us to this impasse, doesn't that imply that by avoiding that and other mistakes, we could avoid trouble and enjoy uh, a perpetual republic, to borrow a phrase from Machiavelli? Uh, 
And isn't that similar to liberalism's, or really modernity's, core mistake, that it thought it could solve permanent problems? The, and it thought that politics could be rationalized, that permanent solutions are within man's grasp? Um, but perhaps the loss implied by Professor Mansfield's characteristically laconic answer occurred before modernity, before what Professor Deneen refers to as liberalism even emerged. Perhaps the real cause of our present malaise or problems is, the, is a universalization and trivialization of the classical teaching, taking what was meant for a few and altering it to make it digestible by all, and in the process, turning it into a kind of, if not poison, that perhaps goes too far, but candy, right? Uh, empty calories and, and harmful in the long run. More troubling, perhaps, that change arose from something inherently, more, tr more troubling, perhaps, is the thought that perhaps the change arose from something inherently flawed in classical thought itself. The same way that if the American founding was as perfect as some of its partisans insist, it should not have delivered us with the present impasse that we're in. If the classics were so smart, how were they defeated and supplanted by the moderns? If that is true, then our situation may be somewhat worse than we think. We need a solution not just for liberalism, not just for modernity, but for philosophy itself, or a reform of human thought itself. Uh, having said earlier that you know, the fact that you don't have a solution doesn't mean you're required to shut up uh, and, and pointing out a problem, uh, that's the situation I find myself in, because I don't have a solution to this one either. Um, and uh, that's where I shall end. I want to begin by thanking um, uh, ISI uh, and uh, its team and the Abigail Adams Society, Danilo, Danilo for, uh, uh, for, for the invitation. Uh, especially a pleasure uh, to come uh, to Harvard. I grew up a little bit south of here in Connecticut. I actually grew up on exactly, there have been studies done exactly on the line that splits Yankee territory from Red Sox territory. <laughs> this was a very difficult place to grow up in. Uh, so I did the logical thing that any young man, any young boy growing up in the 1970s would do, which was to root for the Cincinnati Reds, <laughs> which was a smart thing to do back then. I'm not going to be as good uh, a guest uh, as, uh, as Michael, uh, who I want to also publicly acknowledge and thank, especially for uh, appearing in my class earlier this week. I had never met Michael before, interacted with him, but he zoomed into my class uh, and uh, was absolutely phenomenal. Uh, and hearing him speak... Uh, I realized I'd gotten myself into a real pickle. And my, my, to my students who are tuning in, uh, you know, just the fact I showed up is, is uh, some sign of my sense of responsibility. But I'm not going to be a great guest because um, in some ways I want to debate the proposition tonight. Return to the founders to save America. Now, if this were a debate between a kind of typical progressive, just like take a random person here in Cambridge, and... <laughs> and a mainstream conservative, we would know what the, what the division would be. It would be pretty clear, and the outcome would be pretty predictable. The progressive would oppose the idea of returning to anything, or would argue that the Constitution is a living document and that its meaning necessarily changes with the times. The mainstream conservative, in fact, I think you heard a version of this, would argue that if we can't strictly return to the Constitution, at least we need to return to the to the meaning and to the wisdom of the founding informed by the genius of the Western tradition and informed by the timeless wisdom of the founders. Now this debate, the one that I'm characterizing, would doubtless be very entertaining. Uh, would, would have packed twice as many people into this, into this large room. It would have been like watching the Christians fighting the lions, uh, the modern, you know, a modern uh, fight, uh, wrestling match and worldwide, Federation, World Wrestling Federation, in which we know the contest is staged, we know what the outcome will be, but still it's entertaining, it's a fun night out. At such a debate, everyone would know where they stood at the beginning of the debate, and they would, knew, and they would know where they stand at the end of the debate. And that's what's really interesting about tonight, I think, and I really do give credit to Danilo and to ISI for the genius of offering something different, not the sparring match you typically get if you flip between Fox and MSNBC, but rather something which I, coming into this, I had no idea what we'd be actually debating. Uh, I guess Michael 
articulated what we're supposed to debate, but notice it pits two conservatives, both of whom are on record as being critics not only of progressivism, but of the reigning orthodoxy of conservatism. And that's the reason I invited Michael into my class, was for his infamous or famous essay of the Flight 93 election. And so coming into tonight, into tonight, and at least as of a few minutes ago, I was at least as much in the dark as all of you about what would emerge. And until hearing Michael, uh, it was as difficult to predict as a first round matchup between a 12 seed and a five seed. I'm the 12 seed, by the way, <laughs> which sometimes upsets, you know, sometimes upsets uh, the five seed, but you should all be rooting for me because I'm the underdog. <laughs> One thing is clear to me that given the participants in this debate, the proposition isn't, I think, exactly what the organizers intended. I think the more accurate, or maybe the fuller proposition, would actually have to read something like this. To save America, should conservatives return to the founders? In either case, certainly in the case of conservatives and possibly even in the case of America, it seems to me that America in some ways has never left the founders. Discussing the de and debating the meaning of the American founding has been surging as a topic of scholarly and intellectual uh, debate and inquiry, and especially since the 1960s. It's a fairly recent phenomenon, and it hasn't declined since. I actually looked into this by using the invaluable Google Ngram. You might be familiar with this. A really fascinating little tool you can all look into, uh, which um, if you plug in various words or word combinations, Google will search all of the books in its database, which is at this point roughly 40 million books. And it will tell you the frequency of the use of those words or that word combinations over time. Here are a few find findings uh, that I discovered recently. The combination of the words American founding, put in those two words, was almost non-existent until the 1940s, at least in these books, 40 million or so, and then rose steadily in, a, in an ascent throughout the 1950s until today, hitting its high watermark in 2017 before falling back slightly in the mid to 2000s, but still at a highly elevated level. The combination of the words founding fathers shows a similar pattern beginning its ascent somewhat earlier, starting in the 1930s, and hitting several peaks throughout the latter part of the 20th century, with a high water mark in my birth year of 1964, but with comparable peaks in 1975, 1987, 2008, and 2016, and today is still highly elevated as compared to pre-World War II levels. The word originalism, a word on everybody's lips these days, that is the jurisprudence that attempts to arrive at judicial decisions based upon an intimate understanding of the intent of the founders or those who ratified the Constitution and its amendments was non-existent, of course, until the 1980s when it was first coined, but then skyrocketed in a dramatic ascent, jumping to new highs nearly every decade since the 1980s with the highest le level yet recorded in 2018. And it is certainly likely that it will go higher with the recent publication of Harvard Law Professor Adrian Vermeule's controversial and important new book, Con Common Good Conservat Constitutionalism. The absolute quantity of scholarly and intellectual work on the founders is staggering. And with a great deal taking place in the academy, but perhaps even more taking place in the sprawling, especially the sprawling conservative network of very well-funded programs, institutes, and centers, either on, near, or off campus. One partial, a partial roster would include tonight's co-sponsors, ISI, and to a certain extent, the Abigail Adams Society, the Heritage Foundation, AEI, the Claremont Institute, uh, the Jack Miller Center, the Madison Program at Princeton and its associated institute, the Witherspoon Institute, a, and a vast plethora of imitators, campus and off-campus and near-campus centers and programs and initiatives and institutes. We would, of course, include seemingly all, as we've heard, the entirety of Hillsdale College, including the Kirby Graduate Program located in Washington, D.C., where, where Professor Anton teaches, one close to my own home is the newly founded center on the Notre Dame campus, the Center for Citizenship and Constitutional Government. Hi, Philip, if you're watching, which according to a tweet by its founder, my colleague Philip Munoz was founded with a donation of $10 million. 
There's an umbrella institution for all of these institutes, the Foundation for the Excellence in Higher Education, also with an operating budget of $10 million. You can find these things out by looking at tax returns. In fact, if I tried to list the names of all of the programs around the country, including one here at Harvard, or even around the entire world, it would consume all of my time in my entire opening statement. And that, of course, would prove the proposition is easily falsified. Because in the conservative world, the, re the return is not necessary. It's always been there. But it's the sentiment behind the proposal that's of interest tonight. Should conservatives keep doing what they've been doing? How has that been working out for us? This last question is, of course, particularly pressing, since, as Michael indicates and admits, just look around you. What's been conserved? What have conservatives succeeded after these millions upon millions of dollars invested in the project of returning to the founding? Noth nothing. Any capitalist of any sense would say, let's stop throwing money into this losing investment. And yet, new centers are popping up every day. $10 million here, $10 million there. What's going on? If it's not conservatism that the return to the founders has served, then we might rightly ask, what are all these donors getting from their money? Why do they keep donating? I'd like actually to propose a different title or proposition that focuses our attention not on how we as scholars might debate the specifics of the founding, which Michael dutifully played that role, but rather the following question. What purpose has conservatism's ceaseless call to return to the founding served? Whose ends? What ends are being served? And why is it continue? What goals have guided conservatism's vast and well-funded array of think tanks, summer seminars, internship programs, and so on, cultivating the next generation of academics, uh, the next generation of think tank uh, uh, um, denizens, the wide array of network of on, near, and off-campus institutes and programs, and even the founding of new colleges, all animated by a return to the founding. Now, it won't surprise you to hear me conclude that it has to do with liberalism. But I may surprise you a little bit to suggest that it has had actually relatively little to do with the founding, per se, and more to do with particular political needs and demands that were existing in the middle part of the 20th century when you begin to see the rise of all of these discussions of the founding. And that, and that relied upon, and indeed advanced out of necessity, or what was believed to be necessity, a theory of the founding that was pristinely liberal. The founding by this telling was largely reducible to a set of philosophical ideas whose most distinct appeal lie in a liberal grounding that was timeless and placeless. America was cast as an idea, as a theory. And indeed, note the importance of political philosophy. Leo Strauss's name was mentioned the centrality of political theory, where the greatest concentration of conservatives that still exist on college campuses today are likely to be found because of this focus on turning or understanding the American project as a theoretical project. Like the state of nature itself, the liberal philosophers who were of particular interest, particularly John Locke, the founding itself came to be understood as a set of principles that transcended place, transcended history, that were advanced as self-evident and as universal. Now the appeal to this approach, occurring when it did in a specific time and place, lie in those specific historical and political contingencies in mid-century post-World War II, Cold War America. Following World War II, America was elevated to the status of an uncontested superpower for the first time in its history, something it had wrestled whether it would assume this position, but now it was in some ways default. It was now the most powerful nation on the planet. It faced an adversary, the Soviet Union, that itself advanced an ideology which it claimed to be universal, the universal and homogenous post-state. Nations came under the sway of the Soviet Union, either through the force of arms, as we are now today again seeing, or by the appeal of its revolutionary ideology. Domestically, progressivism, as we've heard, bore a family resemblance to this ideology, one based in the same philosophic tradition of historicism. A response was needed both to combat the threat of communism abroad 
and the domestic adversary of progressivism, while at the same time addressing the world in its new status as a global power. The need to fashion then a vision for ascendant American hegemony, both for domestic and international purposes, was the seedbed for a highly theoretical, philosophical, and even, yes, ideological explanation of what America was, how we were to understand it. The American project was necessarily conceived as a competitor universalistic set of ideas that were ahistorical, delinked from any geographic place, any particular set of cultural or historical conditions. This particular fashioning of the American project in the first place served as an intended beacon to nations that sought to align with the United States and with Europe and with the Western coalition. And I know this well, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, I worked for a time as a speechwriter for an organization that was created in, in the aftermath around this time called the United States Information Agency, which was charged with public diplomacy. Its motto was telling America's story to the world. It was to be our propaganda wing of displaying to the world our universal principles that were be, to be put into competition with, uh, with the communist nemesis. And I worked, I was a speechwriter for the director of that agency, um, the last director of that agency before it ceased to exist. Uh, the director would, uh, at one point, brought me into his, uh, his, his private office and showed me the closet uh, where uh, you could hang your coats. And he showed me one of the legacies of a previous director, which was a bulletproof vest, which was always worn in public by Charles Wick, who was the director of the United States Information, Information Agency under Ronald Reagan. And Charles Wick would tell anyone who asked, I am the second person or maybe third person most likely to be assassinated uh, in the United States government after Ronald Reagan himself and Caspar Weinberger, the head of the Department of Defense, because I represent the most dangerous viewpoint uh, opposing the communist menace. That was a pretty, pretty vivid example. Secondly, the resort to an abstract universalism served as an ideal means to achieving domestic unification among various varying opponents of communism at the time, whether evangelical Protestant, libertarian, Catholic, Jewish, and so on. This is what came to be known as conservatism. Now, conceiving of the American project then as both universal and ahistorical served two groups of people who were advancing, on the one hand, a domestic, particular domestic set of causes and an international set of causes. So there were two specific groups that had a special interest in advancing this ahistorical, sort of deracinated understanding of America. Firstly, an airbrushed liberal reading of the Constitution was attractive to a particular key constituency in particular, economic libertarians and the business community, while themselves representing a relatively small percentage of the, of the electoral base, they played an outsized role, especially as the funders of what would become this vast network of conservative institutions that I guess gave you the tiniest uh, insight into some of those uh, some of those names. Intellectual histories of the period, and there are a number that have come out in recent years, show that there were actually many contenders for what might become the main philosophical opponent and competitor to communism and to progressivism. This was a time of ferment. Among these was Burkean traditionalism, represented by, above all by Russell Kirk, common law constitutionalism, which was represented by my former Georgetown colleague, George Carey, a Jeffersonian and Tocquevillian tradition, uh, in many ways informed by a kind of agrarian tradition, but today represented by, especially by Wendell Berry, uh, and even, a, even kind of attempts by Catholics, ranging from the liberal John Courtney Murray to the largely now forgotten proto-integralist Brent Bozell. And while many of these elements were eventually incorporated into them as minor themes in the conservative movement, its institutional form became dominated by those who were paying the piper. And who, were pay, who was paying the piper? The likes of Joseph Coors, uh, Coors of the Coors Beer Company. You students may have heard of that. Uh, uh, who, who founded uh, the Heritage Foundation. John Engalichev, I think I'm pronouncing that cor correctly, who founded the Fund for American Studies and Young American Foundation, YAF. Uh, 
Richard Mellon Scaife, who had his hands in just about everything, and today the Koch brothers, who have more hands than just about everything. The second group relied and indeed encouraged a reading of the founding that was theoretical, universal, and timeless because it undergirded a foreign policy that could be cast as a global competitor to the universalist ideology of the Soviet Union. A liberal reading of the founding was especially appealing to the neoconservative wing of the Republican Party, many of whom took the lead in the expansion of America's defense sector, its military sector, and its growing international garrison imperium. The, this universalist appeal was, of course, on full display in the lead up to the war in Iraq, when it was argued, among other things, we had to spread democracy in the world, and was invoked with a kind of universalist purity, if you go back and read the second inaugural address of George W. Bush. Interestingly, one of those neoconservatives who believed firmly in the call, cause of spreading democracy, liberal democracy everywhere, uh, was a former president of, uh, of, of, of St. John's College, John Agresto, who ran the American University in Iraq after the American invasion, but who would later write a book called Mugged by Reality, a play on an oft-used phrase to describe how one-time Marxists became conservatives, but he used it to describe how he, a one-time neoconservative, became a Burkean after the American ideology confronted the reality of the, on the ground in Iraq. At least someone admitted that the universal aspiration had its limits. In short, the two groups that came to dominate the conservative complex advanced what was titled by Eisenhower in his farewell address as the military-industrial complex. A universalist theoretical construction of America proved critical to the domestic and international requirements of these two groups that work very closely together, of course. Conservatism then ended up advancing the two most destabilizing forces for lived conservatism, culminating in both cases in a form of globalism that simultaneously degraded existing Republican virtues, which was exactly the reason why Eisenhower warned his fellow Americans about this industrial military complex at the time he left office. Now, while conservatives decry the baleful effects of progressivism, and it is doubtless the case, there was not a little distraction that was going on calling us to pay attention to what was happening with the left hand, but don't pay any attention to what's happening with the right hand. The evidence from the post-World War II reign of the American hegemony should be clear. The past five decades have been very good for the managerial elite that runs the military-industrial complex. All of you Harvard students are going to do very well in it, but doing exceedingly poor for anything recognizably conservative. And it's not America's founding that's to blame as such, but a significant part of what is to blame is a highly selective, tendentious interpretation of the founding that co-opted the label conservative, but that ultimately bore little, if any, relation to the American nation at the time of the American founding, one that was, in fact, and here I'll agree with Michael, profoundly conservative. Let me conclude by noting one final problematic aspect of the appeal to the return to the founding namely by trying to cast some light on the work that's being done by the language of return. Return, after all, sounds conservative. It's an appeal to the past, a turning back, a resistance to heedless lurching into the future, Suggest suggesting we should stand athwart history yelling back. The language of return invokes the superiority of the past, the wisdom of the ancients, the anchoring truths of our forebears. The call to return to the founding sounds like an appeal to something, ta to something ancient. And yet the call to return to the founding, if I'm right, is in fact an appeal to return to a set of ideas, a set of philosophic principles, ultimately a theory, abstractions that don't actually reflect any actual human community that has ever existed, not in its fullness. Note that such conservatives never appeal to an, any, any actual particular time, but rather a detached set of theoretical constructs, ones that are ultimately about as real as the state of nature. While the appeal to the American founding sounds like an appeal to the past, its essence actually shares more with the utopianism of the progressives that it typically condemns. The founding, by this telling, has never really been tried. 
it still lies in our future. We're waiting for our actual founding to occur. All the while, the appeal to this liberal utopian future, like the example of the Soviet Union, it was developed to contend with, serves as a shroud for a power elite that advances its interests at the, at the expense of the kulaks. We don't need a return to the founding. What we need is a less theoretical, less ideological America. We need more history, less theory. We need more memory, less fantasy. More focus on what we must build so that we have something to conserve rather than defending to the last breath a philosophy of profligacy and hubris that continuously degrades whatever virtues remain. And above all, conservatives and Americans should undo the destruction that has been wrought by a highly tendentious and abstract understanding of America that rests on libertarian wish casting about the founding. Instead, we must begin by doing the thing that our founders did. What is the good? What is the common good? Here I'll agree with Michael. They were facing a set of questions and problems. We have to do the same thing now. We have to do it in respect to where we are now. Our Constitution and our nation as a whole is capacious and rich enough in traditions and, yes, still in practices to provide powerful support for a renewal of ancient and modern concern for the common good. And where it's the case that our own national loam is in some places too thin, too depleted, too desiccated to provide the nutrients for a robust common good, then let us commit to enriching our soil, to cultivating a rich hummus in which new roots can be grown and deepen and spread. And let us do so with as much energy and passion as, and commitment as inspired our forebears who built places like this university before it was wealthy and before it was famous, simply out of a sense of self-sacrifice, out of a store of Republican virtue and an aspiration to create what is good, a good that is common, a good that could be shared in our generation and for our children and for our children's children. Thank you. So, M Michael, if you wish to uh, respond, and you're going to see our student fellows circulate and pick up uh, your cards. So if you have a question, just pass it on to one of these young people coming through the aisles. So okay. maybe five to 10 minutes so yeah. we can get some questions. I don't, yeah. I don't have a lot to say. I mean, the criticism of institutional conservatism is certainly one that I share and have made, uh, and maybe even with more rancor <laughs> than with you, you put it. Uh, you know, these, these institutions have basically failed. One of the things that, you know, I think those of us in the room who are teachers, by definition, you're usually teaching people who are younger than you, and you, you get to learn the, the, the way the kids talk, you get to learn some of their slang. I try not to use it much because there's nothing kind of more contemptible than some older person trying to be hip like, like the kids. But you know, they would say, it's all a grift, right? Grift is a very favorite word among younger people on the right. Like hey, all these places, it's a grift. And that's totally right. Um, the misinterpretation in the founding, I think that's also totally right. For specific uh, self-interested purposes, right? The dumbing down, the oversimplification uh, of the founding in order to push a particular agenda that, and may, by coincidence or not, probably not, tends to keep certain people in power, prestige, position, and so on. And I will say, I've said this before, so there's no reason not to say it again. To some extent, my subsect is, bears some of the blame for this, okay? That is to say, the, the, you know, the Claremont School or some of our friends uh, and my friends um, uh, for those, you know, uh, another thing about being a teacher is you got to be careful what references you make because there's a lot of things you take for granted that young people look at you blankly and like, what are you talking about? Um, Cracker Jacks are a candy that used to come with a little comic book inside. You open them up, everyone, and there were four panels. There's not a very long story you can tell in four panels, right? So I, I, I use this term occasionally, Cracker Jack Claremontism, which is a way that certain people think they understand the argument that we've tried, my colleagues and I at Hillsdale and at Claremont have tried to make over the years, but all they get is the universal part, right? They get, yes, that the, the Declaration of Independence declares a universal principle that the basis of citizenship is at least in practice open to all, their naturalization is possible. And so they basically, they, they when you shrink that all down to the little four-panel comic about as big as your thumbnail, uh, 
it comes up to America's an idea. It doesn't really have a soil, a people, a history, any traditions, right? It can be completely separated from that. All you got to know is the theory, a couple of lines, and you got it, right? And look, I, our, my team, in a way, has, uh, are partly responsible for that, and are, I think are, we're being trying to, at least I certainly have been trying to do my part um, to correct it. Um, uh, I guess I, 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 I don't want to take up my 10 minutes in part because I already took half of them before. Um, but when you said at the you know, we need a less theoretical and we need a more historical account, I thought, okay, that's probably right. But then you also said you raised the theor fundamentally theoretical questions. What is the good? What is the common good? I don't know that you can answer those questions adequately, solely, or even primarily with recourse to history without thinking theoretically. And I guess the one point I'm going to make reiterate now is um, you know, the first line, the first paragraph of the Declaration of Independence is one sentence, and there's a lot in there. But remember what that, the, the surface of that sentence, before we unpack it, purports to be is an explanation of why are we doing this at all? Why are we even writing this document? Because of a decent respect for the opinions of mankind require us to explain ourselves to the world. In other words, they thought they, A, they needed uh, a sound theoretical basis for political legitimacy, and they had to say it. They had to be able to articulate it and to say it. And I don't know, in the context of the modern world, in modern America, where you don't have centuries of history behind you, that where everyone's sort of forgotten, you know, you know uh, uh, exactly where, exa you know, when, when does Frenchness arise out of the Gauls, right? When did the Gauls stop being the Gauls and become the French? If we're following Machiavelli, he would just call them the French, even if we're talking about 500 BC, right? It, it, it's lost in the midst of time, and it's easier to be historical about that than when a bunch of people rebel against a tyrant in a given circumstance, um, it, in full view of the world, and everybody can see what's going on, and they can't appeal back to this long history, or maybe they can appeal back, but only about 150 years, all of it well documented. They need some kind of basis, and uh, to me, the, the basic question is, just, is it true? Is what they said true? Is the basis that they declared true? And I think, to borrow from Winston Churchill, it may be true but not exhaustive. That is to say, maybe it, doesn't, it certainly doesn't exhaust all the possibilities, all the permutations of human thought. This gets to the, uh, the quote that I, I, I borrowed from Harvey, you know, Locke in the short run, Aristotle in the long run, indicates that something, there's something that it isn't fully accounted for when you just go with Locke and modernity, but saying that it is necessary or useful in the short run is, is to say that it actually answers uh, real human necessities. And I reiterate that if we can, I still say there's a clear dis difference between what a modern grifter conservative, whoever they may be, I'm not going to name names. I did that once, I got in a lot of trouble. So whoever they are, uh, their account of America, right, it's bad. But I don't think it's the real account. Nor, a, I don't think it's the real account, the true account. And B, I don't think the true account necessarily has to arrive, has to arrive at, at the Cracker Jack version. I don't think that was inevitable. Um, now, as for can we go back, uh, uh, it, it, would it be desirable? In my opinion, yes. Is it possible? I don't know, but I do know. I don't know how to do it easily, except around the margins. You know, let's fight against certain policies today. I mean, one of the conservatives are winning to, to the extent that we are winning. Um, you know, we've racked up a few victories in the last couple of years. Seems to be, you know, and mostly we, we were saying to people by appealing to the American tradition and to American political principles, hey, some of the stuff that uh, the Biden administration or that these bureaucrats or that these corporations are doing violates your, your liberties, violates your historic liberties, but also your liberties simply understood as timeless principles as articulated in the charters of American liberty. And they're, they're winning victories. Not, you know, they're not running the table and they haven't changed everything. But if we forswear any rhetoric uh, around going back or any attempt to try to go back, it seems to me we'd be just leaving a very potent... Um, instrument uh, on the table uh, that we can use to good effect in a cause that I think you and I both agree with. So uh, I, I didn't say no theory. I said in some ways less theory, mm -hmm. or at least uh, our understanding of the past needed to be not uh, turned into theory or, uh, in some senses. But of course, it's not to dismiss the importance of theory. And let me, let me I guess, break my, break my suggestion by talking a little bit about theory. Um, and what I, wanna, what I actually want to talk about is pick up on um, a question that you asked in some ways about me, um, which is sort of what my relationship to Leo Strauss is. Who I've never met the man, obviously. Uh, but uh, it is an opportunity for me to actually um, pay some homage to one of, the great, um, one of the great friendships, I think, that's existed in, in the intellectual world that I certainly was, had a 
had a little bit of a glimpse into, which was the friendship of my teacher, uh, Wilson Carey McWilliams, who taught for many years at uh, Rutgers University and Harvey C. Mansfield here at Harvard University. Uh, two men, very different uh, uh, in, in many respects, uh, but also very good, uh, dear friends. Uh, Carey uh, never studied with Strauss, but he called himself a fellow traveler, uh, which is a term I always like because it's how Marxists would describe themselves uh, from time to time. A fellow traveler of Strauss. Uh, and he, he uh, always acknowledged that he learned a lot from Strauss and that he learned a lot uh, from Harvey as well. Uh, I think um, in some ways one of the, uh, I'll say one thing that about um, the adoption and the fascination um, with Strauss that has always really irked me, and especially as regards the Claremont School. And it seems to me that Strauss was, whether intentionally or unintentionally, uh, misread or read in such a way or emphasized, his teachings were emphasized in such a way, in which the critique, as Strauss engaged in, the critique of historicism was, of course, a critique of progressivism, which became also extended to a critique of the Soviet Union, a belief that history had a trajectory. It wasn't just a critique that it wasn't just the observation that history existed, that the past existed. We could learn something from history. It was an idea of history that was sort of imbued with a kind of moral and kind of almost providential uh, direction and meaning. And that history had a trajectory and that we could know that trajectory with some certainty. Thinkers like Hegel, uh, Kant, Marx obviously, or in, in the United States, uh, John Dewey, uh, Herbert Crowley, uh, that, that this kind of foreign import uh, in some ways theory uh, uh, seems to suggest the, uh, you know, the sort of the nefariousness of this, uh, of this philosophy. But of course, what also Strauss argued was that historicism could also be seen in those who sort of um, looked back, who, who had a historicism looking backwards. That there was a way of being an, an historicist that used the past in a similar way that progressives used the future. And the figure that he named was Burke. Strauss wrote an entire section of his book, Natural Right and History, charging that Burke, like Rousseau, was an historicist. And in some ways, philosophically, this was true, but it's certainly not the case that one would confuse the sort of prudential political philosophy of someone like Burke uh, with the more revolutionary philosophy of someone like Rousseau. So I think the intellectual argument was had purchase. But the problem was that many of Strauss's students who were um, and I think here the Claremont School bears some responsibility for this, were very interested not only in having a, a, a tool by which to attack and criticize progressives and the progressive movement, but were very interested in having a tool by which to criticize conservatism. Conservatism as a form of traditionalism. Conservatism as a form of, uh, of, of, of an inheritance of what we learn from the past, of why a place like Harvard uh, why places like Princeton and Yale, why the most important buildings on this campus is, is almost always the library. Because that's where we store memory. That's where we, in some ways, contain the hard-won knowledge of the past. And it's worth, worth reminding people that Harvey Mansfield's first book was on Edmund Burke, uh, for those of you who might doubt his conservative credentials. Uh, but, um, I wish I doubt any of you do. Uh, so, the, so there was an emphasis on, on, on this intellectual argument of Strauss, but a de-emphasis by these same people on another argument by, of Strauss, which was that for Strauss, progressivism, historicism, arose in some ways as a natural consequence of the first wave of modernity, that is to say, liberalism. That progressivism was not a foreign import as such. It was a natural consequence of inherent features of liberalism, which had to do with the, with the desire for autonomy, the desire for mastery, uh, that the connection of mastery and science and technology that would eventually get extended, of course, to our own nature and to our ability to control history and our own destiny. So these two things are not as opposite. Therefore, in some senses, it's not a foreign import uh, that progressivism developed or, or came to America's shore simply because of the nefarious Germans like the same way we buy BMWs, we import bad philosophy. It was already, in some ways, built into the project. And this was Strauss's argument. But this part of the argument was always soft-pedaled, or forgotten, or ignored, to the point where people like Harry Jaffa at Claremont argued that liberalism had more in common with the ancient tradition, 
than it did with progressivism, say, arguing that Locke is more similar to Aquinas and Aristotle than he is to someone like Rousseau. Well, that, that was Harry Jaffa, who was a very interesting man. Uh, but that is a really a strange, bizarre, and ultimately a fallacious argument. So I'll agree with Michael uh, that, um, uh, that Claremont, among other institutions, plays some role, it seems to me, in a kind of use of a figure, of an intellectual figure like Strauss, to provide for this kind of tendentious reading uh, of the American founding and of the sort of the movement of, of modernity general, uh, generally. And the question now is not, it seems to me, what do we go back to? I think we can use the resources of the past. We can use the resources of philosophy and history and law uh, as valuable uh, resources, like libraries are. But we can only go forward in the same way that our founding fathers knew that they could only go forward. You can only go forward from the situation that you're in right now with the wisdom and with the teachings that you have at hand. And we have to take where we are right now and build from where we are right now. But it seems to me one of the things we cannot do, we ought not to do, is simply say we must return to the founding. If that means continuing to invest millions of dollars in doing exactly the same thing we've been doing for the last 50 years, which has conserved nothing. I don't, I, I don't disagree with that. I, I would just say one thing about Jaffa, which is, his argument was a little different than that, he, I, and I hinted at you, I was using him without naming him in my remarks, that there's a, there are, there's a fundamental change between ancient times and, even, and medieval times that leads to modernity, and many factors to that fundamental change make the return to ancient thought, uh, at least as a basis for political practice, impossible, and so new principles for legitimacy have to be thought through given the change in circumstances, leading to a famous comment of his in one of his essays, widely ridiculed by his critics and enemies, uh, where he says something like, if, if Aristotle had been alive in the, in the 16th or the 17th century, he, instead of writing the politics, he would have wrote something like the Second Treatise. Now, Java may have been wrong about that, but it's not simply that, he's, he's not saying simply that Locke has more in common with the ancients than he has with modern liberalism. He's saying, rightly or wrongly, that the fundamental change in circumstance required a new solution. And again, this is a huge, I mean, I don't want to make this all about interest, Straussian disputes, but Jaffo did not convince the majority of his, uh, of, of his fellow students of Strauss, who knew Strauss personally, that he was right about this. Um, and this is a kind of still live and open question. Um, I think though, you know, the, the, and, and yeah, I'm kind of on one side of it, as are my friends, but we also, uh, I don't know what the age cutoff is, but most of us under a certain age realize that that older version did have a lot of the problems that you thought. And this is why, you know, we're, we're um, a lot friendlier with people on the more traditionalist side now and, and, and talk to them and debate them and, and go to their conferences and things like that in a way that would have been impossible when some of these wars were at their absolute peak in the 60s and 70s. But I also like to remind people that Jaffa himself, uh, who could be um, intemperate in print, maybe that's the way I would put it, um, nonetheless maintained actually very close personal friendships with people like Mel Bradford and, Wil and Wilmore Kendall. And younger uh, followers or people interested in those thinkers all they know is they read the print and they think, wow, this guy, they really hated each other. And you know, your, your, your mentor back there, boy, he, he must have been a real jerk, wasn't he? I'm like, well, you know, he had his sharp side. But do you not realize how close he was to these people personally and how much he respected them even as they disagreed? And people don't know that and they don't remember that. And it's good that we can all, I think we, sh we ought to try to remember that kind of thing. So, so Patrick, I thought you did a really nice job historicizing Right. Um, the, uh, this, is, this was the whole point in some ways of the talk, right? Uh, the, the, uh, the question, the resolution even. And you, you made an argument, if, if I can put it in my words, that we are still conservatives at any rate, um, rhetorically founderist, but operationally managerial technocratic. Um, power elite was the, the, the word you used in some, in some sense, perhaps as we hear at Harvard, right? Okay, so tell us maybe what would a return to the real historical founding, or more historically, so what would that look like practically? Not this universal, abstract, deracinated founding, as you call it. Is that just a non-starter? Is that a completely, you can't, can you go back to something like that? What might that look like? Can you paint us a more concrete historical picture? Well, again, I, I, I wanna resist the, um, 
the idea that you can go back in the sense of let's, you know, we can step back in time and recreate something then now. Um, but I, I think that one thing we can say is uh, whatever one wants to say about the, how one interprets the Constitution today, and they're obviously, again, Adrian Vermeule is in the, is in the audience, there are, there are some really pitched debates going on today about how to interpret the Constitution. One thing that the founding generation had no doubt about was that the law is a moral teacher. The law teaches, right? And that people need teachers in the, in the most comprehensive sense. That to leave people to sort of figure out virtue on their own is to be irresponsible. Uh, to, to sort of you know, say liberty is for the purpose of you going out and making all the mistakes possible so that you'll figure out what virtue is. This is not what human civilization is all about. Right? We, wanna, we want our kids to go out and learn things in the world, but we also want them to survive their childhood. Uh, and we want them, you know, we want to give them good practices and good habits uh, and, and good guidance about how it is they're going to live their lives. Now, this is paternalistic, but this is in some ways to be an Aristotelian or a Thomist, Thomist for a moment. This is in some ways what, a, what, a, what the common good in some ways relies upon, is the law as a teacher. So if we look back to the era of the founding, there was no doubt that when it came to some of the most difficult aspects of life, what it was to lead a life that was moral both in one's comportment, in one's sexual life, in one's economic life, frugality, in one's political life, um, civic responsibility, in one's life as a citizen, the expectation that you would be a soldier when called upon. Massachusetts once had a law that you had to own a gun if you were a male of a certain age. It wasn't just that you had a right to own a gun, you were required to own a gun and to know how to use it because the expectation was you would be a soldier if called upon. These are the kinds of laws that were meant to be teachers of people, not simply relying on the possibility that you would develop virtues, but with the expectation that the law was a teacher. So what would it begin to look like if, let's say, those who were interested in reversing what we might think of as some of the trends, you know, Michael and I probably don't disagree on this, the trends of contemporary society that don't necessarily have to be put in the terms of return per se, but what would it look like in today's society to begin to think about the ways that the law can be a kind of teacher. What, what kinds of laws might we institute today? Some things we've talked about is, uh, for example, would, would, it be, would it be possible in some places, some towns, some communities, uh, to begin to return, there I use that word, uh, to begin to entertain the possibility of some kind of a Sabbatarian law, a law that would allow us a day of rest. I actually had a conversation with my uh, postal carrier the other day, and I said, I notice you've been working on Sundays. What's going on? And she said, Amazon. Amazon. We have to deliver on Sundays. I said, so you don't get a day off? She said, sometimes. So it would be immensely popular, I think, certainly among some of the old-fashioned working class unions, if they exist, uh, as well as religious people. Here would be a great possibility of combining what had once been you know, a kind of coalition of people for whom having a day of rest would be good for family life, for our economic life, for our spiritual life. Uh, I, think we be, I think we can begin to think about a whole range of areas where it's difficult today to live lives of virtue and that the law could help us. But simply to answer either that the law is oppressive, as typically people on both the left and the libertarian right tend to do, is to give short shrift to the idea of how hard it is to be a human being and a citizen. I don't disagree with that, uh, especially the point of the, the, A, that the law is a teacher, and B, that the founders agree. Of course they did. I guess I just would point out that um, in partial vindication of you know, my subsect, that is, in a way, precisely the argument that Jaffa and many of his students make when they say that there's a continuity between the founding uh, not, not, not a hundred, you know, complete perfect Venn diagram, but tons of overlap between the founding and the ancients, right? That, because that view you just stated is more or less Plato's view in the laws. And uh, that, you know, the, Jaffa's most controversial, probably, statement on these kinds of subjects was that there's a, that the break between the ancients and moderns, however radical in theory, uh, is lesser in practice than at first appears when you look at what the founders actually believed and tried to put in, into practice. So, you know, maybe you and I still have a kind of high-flown difference somewhere up in the ether, but when we're talking about what we want to do right now, it doesn't seem like we have much of at all. And even when we're talking about how we're going to interpret the founders, it doesn't seem like we have much of one at all. I think this one
uh, wasn't the corruption of the American regime inevitable mm. for the reasons given by Plato and Aristotle? America is a democracy. It takes a partial and yeah. biased view of justice, that justice is equality to the exclusion of other considerations. Hence, as Plato describes, it becomes ever more intolerant and perceived inequalities such as between the sexes or inequalities between teachers and students, parents and children become mm. Get, to bear. Uh, Maybe, but even so, remember the, the best regime itself comes apart. So it's not merely because America is democratic or Republican. You know, I, I think I raised this in my remarks. And it's not a wonderfully comforting thought, and I don't purport to answer it, but perhaps no matter how well you do in founding and writing the laws, no matter how balanced the regime is, no matter how many uh, institutions or hedges or mitigations against democratic excess you introduce successfully, the thing is still eventually going to come apart. And that's just the way it, and that's just the way it is. Um, to Anton, again, uh, and again, uh, unfiltered. Would the first condition require separation, rejecting federalism, emphasizing states' rights? I think you're talking about the conditions of, of going backward, in which I said some, something like a restoration of the polis. I mean, my view is no, not nearly enough. Like it, if we really want to go back to pre-modernity, pre-liberalism, we got to get even quite a bit more radical than that, even if in the current context, I think quite a lot more federalism would be good for America and if not solve a lot of our problems, mitigate a lot of our problems. There's a lot of what is going on now that's causing these really bad divisions in the country and all of this acrimony and partisan hatred is, um, well, I'll paraphrase Machiavelli, you know, he says in Prince Nine, uh, the great desire to command and oppress the people, the people desire to be neither commanded nor oppressed. And so, you know, since they live together, these are incompatible desires, right? It seems to me that Red America doesn't have a particularly great desire to like, tell Blue what to do, um, but Blue really has a great desire. And I speak as a Blue person who's only lived in Blue places, has a really strong desire to command and oppress the Reds. And a little bit more federalism so that the Reds can say, you know, leave me alone, uh, might help simmer things down a bit, even if it doesn't solve the fundamental problem that I laid out. I just respond to that. I, 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 I'm somewhat, I guess, in a slightly earlier incarnation, a strong proponent of localism, of federalism, um, and, I, and I remain that way. But I think one way that in which we have to be cognizant of where we are now uh, is to recognize that federalism um, is insufficient, at least at some level. At least the, the, the premise of federalism is that, that the local is the best place to handle most of our divisions today uh, is, is really, it's, it's limited uh, and problematic in as much as the, ch the challenges we face today are not merely, you know, to speak of the red and blue, are not merely and in often case not coming necessarily from the federal government. Mm -hmm. They're coming from titanic economic powers mm -hmm. that are trans, not just trans, uh, trans state, uh, but transnational. And we had a pretty pretty evident uh, example of this instance of this not a few, uh, just a few years ago in my, my red state of Indiana, where Indiana attempted to pass a Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which exists in 40-something states in the United States. And in response to this, uh, several economic, large economic actors threatened the economic ruin of the state of Indiana, among them Amazon, Apple, Salesforce, the NCAA, NASCAR even got into the act. Who would have thought NASCAR? Uh, and forced the legislature, essentially, and Mike Pence, who was then governor, not only to reverse the legislation, but to, revide, to rewrite it so it wasn't, in effect, its opposite. So here we had, and whenever I hear one of my colleagues denounce this or that action as undemocratic, as a threat to democracy, I said, where were you? When a, when a duly enacted act passed by a state, sovereign state legislature, signed into law by the governor, was overruled by titanic corporate actors. Where was the denunciation of, democ uh, denunciation of people who were being anti-democratic then? This idea that somehow you know, democracy is the, is the great value is just a, it's a, complete, it's a complete and utter falsehood. The great value, whenever anyone invokes the language of democracy, what they really mean is liberalism. Right? And they use the language of democracy to shroud it. So federalism, localism, is good as far as it goes, but we have to recognize that today, uh, we're actually going to need the power of the federal government in instances such as that. Mm -hmm. uh, and conservatives have to be willing to be able to 
recognize this and use federal power toward the ends that actually constitute the common good, that we can't be averse or hesitant, uh, but actually uh, able to and, uh, and, and capable of using and exercising those powers. Is there any longer something we could call a truly quote unquote American sense or maybe public culture? What hope is there for a revival or for post-liberalism if there's no longer a unifying American sense? So that's, I guess, a less abstract theoretical question, more sociological question to both of you, to both of you. Yeah. That's a great question. Um, I, I guess, it did, did, does the question asking if that's universal or close to universal, like shared by 80, 90, 95% of the population, the answer seems to be obviously no. Um, but is it shared by tens of millions, even 100 million, 150 million people? The answer is probably yes. Um, but they, you know, are facing strong headwinds uh, from coastal elites, from corporate power who, you know, I mean, if, if, history, if history has uh, any lessons, one lesson is surely that a small number, relatively small number of people, given sufficient control of institutions, wealth, uh, the narrative and so on can rule very large numbers of people very successfully for a while and that something like that seems to be what's going on right now so even if this American sense is out there in very large numbers it doesn't seem to have great purchase in the corridors of actual power whether those be governmental or corporate or intellectual academic um, so you know to sort of paraphrase Orwell if there is hope it lies with the, you know, the American sense but the American sense has got to find a, a way to get its hands on some of those levers and, and, and use them effectively in its, in its defense and in its interests, and that's proving to be uh, difficult to do. And even when it does get its hands on, on the, the levers, um, I say this as someone who spent six years in the bureaucracy, uh, it's really, you know, even if you're actually in a role, in a job, and you have, theoretically, you have the power to do a certain thing and give a certain order, um, you know, uh, it's hard to get that order carried out. I mean, maybe everybody in this room heard this anecdote, but it's from Richard Neustadt's book on the presidency. It's a famous anecdote. It's Truman sitting in the Oval Office behind the, the buck stops here sign after the 1952 election, but before Eisenhower was sworn in. And remember, Truman had been in the Army. He'd been a captain, an artillery captain in World War I. And he says to whoever was surrounding him, his aides, he says, poor Ike, it, he'll be very frustrated. It won't be a bit like the Army. He'll sit here and say, do this, do that, and nothing will happen. Now that's 1952, or three, I don't know, maybe it was January 53, but in that brief period, right? That particular problem is a lot worse today than it was then. Can I address it? I, so I actually take issue with something Michael said earlier, which is that one of the things that modernity, maybe broadly and liberalism in particular, has done is to resolve and solve the wars of religion. This is one, sort of in the column in the, in the plus column, it's, them. it's I mean, less than them. And I would argue that uh, when this question, and I think the sentiment behind this question really reflects the fact that we are today in a religious war. I don't think there's any other way to understand the division in our country today. This is not normal politics. This is not where you win an election and you get to run the yeah. country for four years and I win the election and I get to run the country for four years. We are in a, in a profoundly, you know, a kind of debate over fundamentally different theologies, if I could call it that. And this is something that, again, to appeal to Professor Mansfield here, this is something Tocqueville recognizes. He says America is founded, its democracy is founded out of the kind of the, the sense of and the belief in a, in, in that, that arises from its Christian origins. He, he, he points to the Puritans, so a good Massachusetts moment, as having been sort of laid the groundwork of what becomes the New England township and what animates democracy in America. But he predicts the rise of a kind of successor religion, the successor religion that will arise in democracy in America, he, said, he predicts, will be various parts pantheism, a belief that sort of God is in everyone, we're all gods, and God is in us, a belief in perfectibility, the belief that we can perfect ourselves, and a kind of soft humanism that would replace the kind of old aristocratic belief in duty uh, to particular people. And I think it's fair to say that we are living in, the, in, a, in a time in which we don't see it. We don't see it visibly as a kind of religious war. But I think that's what we're in right now. And it's a religious war that's arisen right from the heart of liberalism. And this is the, the deepest source of contention, I think, in our society today and why we can't find a resolution. And so I think, in a weird way, if liberalism in part 
arose because the belief was it would resolve, at least at that moment, the wars of religion, it may be the moment when we're going to need a kind of successor philosophy, if I may, I guess, back into the theory again, but also the kinds of practices we're going to need uh, to develop that successor uh, set of beliefs. But I, uh, but I think, the, um, I think to, the, to the question itself, what, what underlies the question is that when a society ceases in some ways to have a kind of deep-seated agreement that is ultimately at the deepest level a kind of profoundly theological agreement, you're likely to see the rise of exactly this kind of division we're experiencing now. Oh, yes, and, but we did have, I mean, this society did have that for a long time. And the, the religious wars I meant were the very specifically sectarian religious wars that racked England in the 17th century, France in the 17th century, the rest of Europe in the first half of the 17th century. I, I forgot, the, I used to know these numbers, but some unbelievable percentage of people died in the, in, in the first half of the 17th century in the Thirty Years' War, especially in the... Uh, the German territories of Germany was not then unified. They did solve that problem. I mean, that kind of thing did not happen in the United States. And if you are right that what is happening now is a religious war, I, I know, I think I see what you're saying. I've always resisted this conclusion because I don't think that the, the secular side thinks of itself in that way. I mean, I know they don't think of themselves in that way. And I also wonder if it's not a st stretching the analogy t too much to call it that, but that's kind of a quibble. Uh, at the very least, at least it's, uh, for the time being, it's cold as opposed to what the founders were trying to deal with in their time. How are we going to have a country with Episcopalians, Ang Congregationalists, Catholics, you name it, you know, Unitarians, and uh, how are we going to get along unless we um, take this question out of politics and make it a matter of conscience? And that was a practical problem that they faced, that they solved. If it is true that it had this unintended consequence that we are living with now, it's up to us to deal with it. I don't know how much blame they deserve for not having adequately foreseen it, though. A question, or I guess this is a combination or hybrid uh, of several questions. Well, you know, another questioning the premise to save America. Isn't that overly dramatic? Can't we think of uh, a number of things that are better now, today, in 2022, than in 1789, 19? 21, as a friend of mine would like to, every time this question comes up, his first answer is always dentistry. <laughs> Maybe more political regime uh, re yeah. uh, related, but in, in other words, you know, things aren't that bad, are they? Well, uh, the wrong person. I, I think you know, I, my my dear departed friend Peter Lawler always used to like to say. Uh, uh, echoing Tocqueville in some respects. Uh, everything's always getting better and everything's always getting worse. Um, and it just kind of depends what we're, what we're focused on. I think it's fair to say that kind of in the world of technology, um, you know, we could say a lot of things have gotten better, although we must also admit that those things that have made things better have also made things worse, yeah. right? I mean, my students can't go, at, go, go a class without at once saying, Social media will save us, and social media is condemning us to hell. I mean, it's kind of simultaneously they're, they're sort of they're living in this kind of psychic divide about uh, this, this uh, sort of digital world that they've inhabited uh, their entire adult conscious lives. Um, but I guess if, if I guess just building on the last uh, question, we are um, if if one of the measures of getting better and getting worse is um, and you know, maybe short of of killing ourselves is are we, are we a social and political order um, that is able in some ways to have, build and, uh, and share some kind of deep, deep forms of agreement about the nature of our society, its direction, its trajectory, what we're committed to, what we believe constitutes the good. I would have to say that at the moment, it looks like things are, are, are bad and that the idea of saving America is not, um, is not an unjustified way of thinking about it. Because we have two really fundamentally different views, I think it's fair to say, about what would constitute saving America. So it's not just one side that thinks America is in peril. Both sides do. Right? There's one side that thinks we're in the, on the threshold of fascism, and there's another side that thinks we're on the threshold of fascism. It's just which one it is. Which totalitarian nightmare you think is incipient, is about to occur. That's not the kind of the sign of a really healthy political society and a healthy political order. So, in some ways, I think we have to acknowledge that um, some of the things, and indeed many of the things that we would count in the plus column, have had the negative 
you know, sort of the, the, the kind of connected negative consequences that have led to this moment. And this is part of the problem of being a human being, is that there's just no, it's not a new science of politics. There's no answer that's not going to have negative sort of side effects. Uh, and I, you know, the question confronting us right now, it seems to me, um, is where, you know, maybe to pick up on an analogy from earlier, where are we in the life cycle of this, of this experiment? Right? Maybe, you know, maybe we're at the end stages uh, and uh, we're seeing the death throes. You know, before someone passes on, there's usually a paroxysms and signs of illness. Maybe it's you know, middle age or even adolescence. It's hard, it's hard to say exactly. I'm gonna take a moment and brag. When I came in tonight, uh, my friend Adrian said, boy, you're looking really good. And I said, yes, I've lost 30 pounds. So I'm a man of somewhat advanced years but I'm feeling really good right now, and I'd like to think we could do this for our country. How about losing about 30 pounds as a country, <laughs> but just go on a little bit of intermittent fasting and eat a little bit healthier food? In other words, all is not lost. We are not doomed. But it means that we do have to recognize that there's a life cycle of countries. Uh, and right now in this country, we actually need, uh, we, we really need to, to be concerned about the underlying health. Uh, and, um, and here, it seem, again, it seems to me that uh, the path, at least that my team, has been on has not been a path to health. It's been a path um, to greater disease. And, and I think that's, that's the inflection point, at least I see, uh, for at least one set of suggestions for what will, what will cure what ails us right now. I just want to say that if it, if it is left to me to determine which 30 pounds to shed, <laughs> I can save America. But I'm not going to state openly yet which ones. You just have to leave that to me, and, and it will be revealed in the, in the course of the doing. <laughs> We are over 10 minutes into overtime, so I'm going to wrap it up uh, five, quickly. Five seed versus a 12 seed. Mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and um, before you join me in thanking our uh, debaters this evening, they are going to hang around for about 15 minutes or so, they agreed. So if you have a question or like to, uh, would like to meet them and talk to them individually, please come up. But thank you very much, Michael and Patrick, and thank you, ISI. Yeah.